All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me get everything set up here, and I think we are good to go. This is day number two of unit six, which is all about imperialism or the consequences of industrialization, as the AP people call it. We'll go ahead and just jump right into our essential questions today. Number one, what were the motiva motivations and justifications for European imperialism during this time period? We went over that in our last lesson. We saw the social Darwinism. We saw the nationalism. We even saw the economic motivations. Motivations. We're really going to focus on essential question number two, which is in what ways does societies respond to and resist imperialism during this time period? There's a couple different ways to look at imperialism. We could look at, for, at it from a European point of view, or we could look at it from an African or Chinese or Indian or Australian point of view. I'm going to attempt to do both. We've already looked at it from a European point point of view. We've seen uh, the, the thinking of Europeans. Now we're going to switch it up and we're going to look at how Africans respond to and resist imperialism. So this very much is from the African point of view today. We're going to go ahead and skip question number three because we're not going to be talking about immigration until a later lesson. And at that point, we'll spend a whole lot of time on that. We should be able to identify the responses Africans had to uh, European imperialism. We're going to see very peaceful reactions. We'll see some some direct resistance and some violence action, violent actions, and then we'll see some uh, religious reactions to uh, European imperialism as well. Let's go ahead and begin with resources in Africa. Why is it that Europeans want to go to Africa? Why even bother going there? Well, there's a whole lot of resources there. As we know, as from our discussion of an industrialized society, once you become industrialized, you become very resource dependent. You want resources. Actually, the historian Dan Carlin talked about this in one of his podcasts and presentations and said that it's almost like a, a physical addiction. Like once you become industrialized, you become addicted to oil and rubber and timber and all these other things that you need to have in order to have an industrialized society. We see here that rubber, timber, gold, and diamonds are going to be um, major resources in Africa that Europeans are going to want to exploit. A big name that we should already be aware of, but it, it's important to talk about him again, is Cecil Rhodes, who is going to attempt to build railroads. He'll ultimately fail from his Cape to Cairo railroad, but he tries to build railroads and other uh, industrialized um, to use other industrialized technology to remove the resources out of Africa in order to benefit the British Empire. And we'll be looking at his words in a later lesson as we prepare for this DBQ. Now, he is building railroads. He was building railroads in Rhodesia, which would have been down here in kind of modern day uh, Zimbabwe, all the, all the way right down here. So you can see that he's ex taking out a lot of res resources, mainly diamonds is what he's most known for. Um, prior to imperialism, we had the age of exploration in which there were trading outposts um, and, and the, uh, the English and, and the French and, the, and everyone else from Europe would come down and trade along the West Coast for slaves, for gold, for ivory, for palm oil, for all of these different things. Well, the slave trade is going to end in the in the 1860s. And so that's that's going to stop and that's going to be. Uh, kind of a blow to the European economy. But you also have to keep in mind the political revolutions. There's no more American colony to help the British. There's no more Latin American colonies to help the Spanish. The French have more or less kind of been kicked out of Canada. And so all of these European nations have to turn their focus somewhere else. Why weren't they looking at Africa first, though? Well, first, the interior of Africa is very, very dense. As you can see, here, like the interior of Africa is, is this jungle. There's a lot of disease in that jungle and um, Europeans were, would succumb to those diseases. In addition, Africa was much more well-established than the Americas. There were a lot more people there. And so there were a lot more people in Africa who could fight against the Europeans and defend their territory. There's two major inventions that change all that. The first one is quinine or quinine, I, I think I pronounced that correctly, which um, treated malaria at least a little bit better and treated some of these other diseases. It didn't necessarily cure them, but it also didn't make you die from them. So um, it, it helps a bit. The other big one is the Maxim machine gun by Hiram Maxim, who is pictured right here. This machine gun um, at, obviously is a product of the Industrial Revolution and very clearly would give Europeans a great advantage 
over um, Africans, especially in any sort of direct resistance or violent conflict. So we have to keep those things in mind, that this industrialization that we talked about in our previous unit directly leads to the imperialism of Africa, as well as other countries that we'll get to in later lectures. Let's go ahead and talk about the British in Egypt and West Africa. We'll talk about the British a bit. We'll talk about the French a little bit as well. And then we'll start looking at things from the African point of view. So first off, the Suez Canal, pictured right here, was built by a Frenchman, Ferdinand de Lesbes. He was also the individual partially responsible for the Panama Canal as well. He at least attempted to build it, but then failed to do so. That's a whole nother story. The British are going to seize control of Egypt and control the canal in 1882. Part of this is the reason why Muhammad Ali starts to come into power because he sees the British influence and he sees that as taken away from the cotton industry. And we talked about that in Unit 5. The British are also in Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and the Gold Coast. We see the British gather up a lot of lands in order to have access to those resources and have access to this major trade route right here through the Suez Canal. We also see the British are going to fight against the Dutch in South Africa in what we call the Boer Wars. Now, the Dutch had been there for an incredibly long time. Um, and we say that the, the people in South Africa who are of Dutch descent were Afrikaners, so they're Dutch descendants in South Africa. The British are going to fight against the Dutch ultimately for control of the resources. South Africa is home to many, many resources, and the British want that, so they're going to fight against the Dutch. What we're seeing here is a precursor to World War I. We can almost look at World War I as a fight for more land and for more resources, and the Boer Wars are essentially that. They are essentially a battle between um, the Dutch and the British over land and resources and ultimately wealth as well. Now, the effects of this are we see a rise in nationalism. The British are going to feel more British and they're going to feel that they represented their nation well in the war. The Dutch are going to feel more like Dutch because they're going to say we're Dutch and we're definitely not British. We're we're one thing and they're, they're a completely different thing. But we also see 100,000 are going to die. Um, we're going to see the use of concentration camps as well. All things that are going to be used throughout the 20th century in both World War I and World War II. The ultimate treaty is that the Boers have some self-governance, um, but for the most part, the British are going to control everything and therefore gain all the wealth from the area as well. Let's go ahead and move on to the French. The French are actually going to use a, a method called the settler colony. All they do is that they send down more French people to Algeria, pictured here in green, and they end up more or less outnumbering and almost outpopulating the, the Algerians who were there. And just because a bunch of French people move there, they're able to take over. We'll see this again when we talk about Australia and we look at New Zealand uh, as well. We're going to see the French also start to drive out the Ottomans, and that's um, that, that's going to continue to occur even after World War One. The British and the French are going to divide up former Ottoman territory, but we'll talk about that more when we get to Unit 7. Now let's go ahead and look at this from a more African point of view. So we've already seen the European imperialism. Now we need to see the reaction to that European imperialism. The first type of reaction are peaceful actions. Most of these are trade negotiations. For example, the Ashanti Kingdom attempts to peacefully engage in trade. The Ashanti Kingdom was on the west coast of Africa. That's the area where the Mali Empire was and the Songhai Empire was. They have almost always, or at least in our study of, of history, traded with Europeans for gold, I'm sorry, they traded gold ivory and slaves for different manufactured goods and textiles and whatever else Europeans happen to have. So the Ashanti Kingdom says, hey, let's keep doing that. We benefit from trade with you guys, you guys benefit from trade with us, so let's just keep trading, no need to take us over. Ethiopia, on the other side of the continent, is a Christian country, something I brought all the way back um, in unit one and said, hey, when we get to unit six, I'm going to talk about this. So Ethiopia as a Christian country appeals to that sense of religious unity between them and Europeans. The Ethiopians say, hey, we're Christian. You guys are Christian. We're surrounded by Muslims. You guys from we know from history are really skeptical of the Muslims. So help us out. We're on the same team here. 
definitely don't take us over. We also see forced treaties like the one that is, is right here. So the Royal Niger Company was a British company that would come in with these blank treaties like this. And all you have to do is fill in the blank. These were usually very unfair treaties. Sometimes they were uh, signed at gunpoint as well, in which the African community would sign over a lot of land and maybe some of the resources to uh, the British or to the French or to whatever European power happened to be there trying to exploit the area. Um, so we see all these peaceful reactions and these negotiations between European and African societies. But then we start to get a more serious and darker uh, form of imperialism. And this by far is the darkest of them. This is King Leopold II of Belgium in Central Africa in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now, this area right here in red has a grand supply of rubber and ivory. If you can control that rubber, um, you can gain a whole lot of wealth. It's during this time period that cars start to come into play as well. And there's a lot of rubber that gets used in cars. And rubber's great. Like it, it's almost as rough and, and tough as steel, but you can actually bend it into whatever shape you want. So if you have rubber, you can gain a whole lot of wealth. Well, King Leopold II owns this personally. He, he has taken it over. It's for his personal supply. What he's going to do is he's going to send people down to work for him who will ruthlessly force the Congolese to go into the forest in order to extract rubber from the rubber trees. Um, when I say extracting rubber from the rubber trees, I don't want you to think they're literally pulling out like rubber tires. The rubber in its natural form is more of this like almost like milk like liquid there. So that's what they're extracting from the trees, similar to where like maple syrup is extracted from maple trees. There's rubber trees and you extract rubber from them. However, the King Leopold II wanted more and more rubber, and he's a very greedy and ruthless individual. So he's going to use force and violence in order to make sure that he can take out all of the resources. He's not really worried about justice or fairness. If you don't bring enough rubber, then you're going to be killed. Ultimately, over the course of about a decade, 10 million Congolese are going to be killed by King Leopold or the people who are underneath King Leopold. Um, this is a horrible, very obviously very dark part of history, but something that is a key part of imperialism that we need to know and be aware of if we're actually going to learn from history. Now, here's a couple pictures I wanted to show you as well. As you can see, this is the head of King Leopold here choking out one of the Congolese workers as uh, his, his wife and uh, assumed child run away in fear. So this shows the ruthlessness of King Leopold. Now, I could tell you more and more about the ruthlessness of King Leopold, but photojournalism does a lot better. We have photojournalism today in which people take pictures of um, areas all over the world in order to show you what's going on. Well, this takes hold in the early 1900s with people like E.D. Morrill. What was happening is that if you were a worker, if you were a Congolese, if you were a slave, I can't even say worker, if you were a slave of King Leopold and you did not bring back enough rubber, your right hand or your left hand would be chopped off as a punishment and in order to show others, in order to like instill fear into the other workers. As you can see, many of these are, are young boys. These are not full grown adult males. These are young boys who are having their hands chopped off and you can see the stubs um, where their hands used to be. These pictures were sent back to Europe and even sent abroad to the United States in order to show the horrific conditions that King Leopold was putting the Congolese under. Now, I had a question a couple of years ago. Um, I had a student sitting in my class and she asked, Mr. Cernak, um, you know, how come I've heard of Adolf Hitler? Like Adolf Hitler, and we, I, I've heard about Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust and the, the killing of 7 million Jews. But I've never heard about King Leopold. This guy seems as if he was just as bad, if not worse, because he's, he's responsible for the deaths of almost 10 million Congolese people. The reality of the situation is that, at least in the United States, especially when I was growing up, we had a very much a Western view of history. We would view things that would really matter to the United States and maybe to Euro Europeans we really didn't study other parts of the world. In fact, my knowledge of world history was very, very limited to America and to Europe. I didn't really know much about 
China or India or Africa or Australia or anything outside of the borders of, of my own country. Recently, that's starting to change. And I do have to give, as much as I make fun of the AP people, I do have to give them a little bit of credit because this class does a very good job at showing uh, <clears throat> excuse me, things outside of Western culture. And that's why I spend a lot of time talking about King Leopold, because it's important to know this history as well. One of my favorite shirts that I see the Black Student Union wear at Rancho High School is that African history didn't start with slavery. That was a, that's a shirt I've seen I've seen a lot. And that's that's true. And then we, we have talked about that. We've looked at the Mali Empire and we looked at the Songhai Empire as well. And we've talked about slavery. But African history also doesn't end with slavery. We have to talk about imperialism, and we certainly have to talk about the decolonization efforts, as we will when we get to Unit 8. Let's go ahead and move on here. We've already talked a little bit about why Africa now, why not Africa before, um, but I do at least want to remind you that one, Africa had many diseases that Europeans would, would catch. Now Europeans have better medicine, and two, Europeans have better weapons because of the Industrial Revolution, and they're going to take advantage of having those better weapons. And we also see other technology that's there to extract the resources, especially out of the interior of Africa. We see our second type of reaction to European imperialism, and this is more violent reactions or um, direct resistance. I'll use both terms, violent and direct resistance to European imperialism. The first one is the Ashanti War of the Golden Stool. Now, this is the Ashanti flag right here, and the Golden Stool was the throne upon which the leaders uh, sat. At this point, it happens to be a queen who is the leader of the Ashanti. Remember, um, as many African societies were matrilineal. Now, one of the British generals sits upon this golden throne and starts to act as if he is the leader of the Ashanti, which greatly upsets the Ashanti warriors, and they end up getting into the, this war, the War of the Golden Stool. Eventually, the British win, and they take over and incorporate the Ashanti Empire into the Gold Coast colony of West Africa. Um, the Ashanti maintain a little bit of independence, kind of in the same way that the United States was a colony of Great Britain. Like, yes, they had a little bit of independence, but overall, Britain had control over them and it, they could, could force them to do anything that they wanted them to do. That's where the Ashanti stand. The Ethiopians, however, are the only successful African country against a European uh, force. At the Battle of Adwa, the Ethiopians fight against a very newly formed Italy. Italy wants to be imperial as well. They want to keep up with all the other strong European countries. And so they try to take over Ethiopia, but ultimately fail. Um, and the Ethiopians successfully defend their land. Um, we will see Italy and Ethiopia. Th there's going to be a continuation in the fighting. And we'll get into that when we talk about World War I in Unit 7. The other two rebellions down here, I'm not going to really mention as much, but we're going to see that there's many different types of rebellions. Generally speaking, Africans are going to lose to the European powers. And so Europeans um, using the superior technology of the Industrial Revolution are going to put down any of these African um, reactions, these violent reactions to European imperialism. We also get our third type of um, reaction, and that's going to be religious rebellions. And we'll see a few examples of religious rebellions, not only in Africa, but we'll even see it when we talk about American expansionism and uh, Native Americans as well. So this is Eastern South Africa in 1856. The British have already started to go into the area and they have brought their own cows with them because that's an area in which cows are going to be able to graze and that's going to be a great resource for um, the British. But these cows carry with them a lung disease which affect the cows that were already there. Um, and so 15-year-old Nongawusi of the Zosa Society is going to be very upset with this and she's going to see the danger that these European mainly British travelers are bringing. She is told by spirits in a dream that she and her people need to destroy all the cattle and kill all the crops. Because they've let these British in, their ancestors are upset with them. And so their ancestors have told them, destroy the cattle, get rid of the crops, and the British will be driven back into the sea. So about 300 to 400,000 cattle are going to kill, but 
going to be killed, but the prophecy does not come true. And as we saw earlier, the British are able to take over. What we need to keep in mind is not necessarily the success or failure of this rebellion, but we need to keep in mind that religion played a key role in the response to European imperialism. We also want to talk about the long-term impacts, and this is going to be the last slide here. Now, this won't necessarily appear up on the test or appear in uh, appear in Unit 6, but I, I, I feel that it's important for me as a history teacher to address this. I've talked much in this class about the long-term impacts of the decisions that are made, and this is one very specific example that I can use in order to show that these things do have long-term impacts. This is Rwanda. This is in the center of Africa. Here's the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is where King Leopold was. So the Belgians were right here, right in this area, and they colonized that area. Now, there were two types of African people in that area. There were the Hutus and the Tutsis. The Tutsis looked more white, and so they were treated much better. They were put into some higher government positions. They had a lot more money. They had the opportunity to enrich themselves a bit. The Hutus were the majority of the people. They were treated very poorly, and they were discriminated against. So this European imperialism has very much divided these two separate groups of people. Fast forward to 1994, European imperialism is done, decolonization efforts have occurred, as we'll see in Unit 8. But what we see is that that animosity, that hatred still exists. By 1994, the Hutus had started to take over because they were the majority and tried to take land and power from um, the Tutsi. It was alleged that a Hutu was flying in in this plane and was shot down by a Tutsi. Now there's um, discrepancy over that story. There's an argument about what exactly occurred. But what we do know that occurred is that this led to a genocide in which the Hutu majority gunned down and killed anywhere from half a million to about a million Tutsi. Um, the UN, the United Nations, as we're going to talk about in Unit 8, did absolutely nothing. They sent in peacekeepers, but they told the peacekeepers don't use any force, which means that the peacekeepers really sat around and did absolutely nothing at all. This event was known as the Rwandan genocide. And this Rwandan genocide was horrible and often sometimes gets ignored in history, once again, because it's not a part of Western history, which is why I feel the need to talk about it here. This genocide was not as big as the Holocaust in terms of number, but it was more efficient in um, the amount of people it, uh, who, who died or who, who were killed. There were more people killed per day during the Rwanda genocide than during the Holocaust, which is really what I'm trying to get at. Ultimately, what I'm trying to show you here is that the long-term impacts of uh, imperialism still exists. This imperialism casts a very long shadow over the history of Africa, and many African societies and countries are still feeling the impacts of imperialism today. Look at the Congolese. They lost 10 million men. That's obviously going to have an impact on the society. Look at Cecil Rhodes in modern-day modern Zimbabwe in Rhodesia. He extracted all of those resources. Obviously, that's going to have a drastic impact on Africa as well. It's important to keep all of these things in mind because ultimately my job as a history teacher is to help you learn from history. And we don't learn just by memorizing facts. We learn by learning about people and how people interact with one another and how people respond to things as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll go ahead and get off my soapbox. That'll be our lecture for today. In our next lecture, we're going to be looking at imperialism in India, Southeast Asia, and China. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.